Hey everybody, in this video we'll be looking at the qualitative test for identifying cations. In the HSC syllabus, there are three main ways we can qualitatively identify and confirm the presence of metal cations. And these are the flame test, complexation, and precipitation. Throughout the video, we'll be talking about each of the tests and what they are suitable for. But for now, it's very important to know that the flame test is only applicable for a certain selection of metals. The complexation test is only applied for transition metals and precipitation test can only be used for metals that form insoluble compounds in water. Before we delve into the first test that is a flame test, it is important to understand a concept called spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the interaction between radiation or EMR and matter. This is the basis of how the flame test works. In spectroscopy, electrons can absorb a discrete amount of energy that is a very specific amount of energy that equals the energy difference between the orbits. In this Bohr's atomic model, what's being shown here is that the atom has multiple orbits. Each orbit contains a different amount of energy. And the further away the orbit is from the nucleus, the more energy it has. Electrons can be excited from the ground state when they absorb a specific amount of energy. The ground state refers to the orbit in which electrons normally are located in. And as they absorb the energy required, they can transition to a higher orbit further away from the nucleus. And this process here is known as excitation. It is very important to know and understand that orbits of different elements have different energy levels due to the intrinsic differences in the atomic structure. And as a result, amount of energy that's being absorbed during this electronic excitation process is very different between elements. And ultimately, this is how the flame test will help us identify different metal cations. The second component of spectroscopy is when the excited electrons from before return to the ground state. So that is, return to their original orbits. In this process, the electrons will release energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. And the amount of energy that's being released in this step equals to the amount of energy that's being absorbed. In other words, more energy absorbed during excitation means more energy is being released during this step when the electrons return to the ground state. Here's a quick reminder of electromagnetic radiation. EMR consists of different types of waves. You've got the gamma waves on the left hand side, followed by the radio waves on the other side of the spectrum. These waves are different frequencies and wavelengths. It's important to know that higher frequency EMR radiation have more energy. So that is, gamma rays have the most energy and radio waves, which have the lowest frequency, have the lowest amount of energy. In this module, we'll be looking at three particular types of EMR, ultraviolet, visible light, and infrared. Now back to the flame test. The flame test is a qualitative application of spectroscopy, and that is the interaction of radiation and matter we just spoke about. In the flame test, the electrons in the metal atoms or ions, they absorb energy in the form of heat. And as a result of this absorption, they are excited to a higher energy level from the ground state. For some certain metal ions, when the electrons return to the ground state after the excitation, they emit colored visible light, which is a type of EMR. And depending on the color, we are able to identify the presence of a particular metal ion. In the diagram below here, you can see four examples of this. So just to recap and reiterate what I was saying, when the metal ions in the sample is exposed to the flame, electrons in the ground state can absorb energy in the form of heat and therefore transition to a high energy orbit. This is then followed by the return to the ground state where they came from, and in the process, they will emit the same amount of energy that was absorbed previously, but this time it is always in the form of EMR. And from some metals, if this is in the form of visible light, we were able to see a special color. The second qualitative test is complexation. And this test only works for transition metal ions. A metal complex refers to a central metal ion, that is a transition metal, being surrounded by molecules 
called ligands. And these ligands are bound to the metal ion via coordinate bonds. The reason why this test is qualitative is because the formation of these metal complexes will give off a very characteristic color. For example, in module 5, we've looked at cobalt 2 hexahydrate, which gives us a very unique pink color. We also looked at the formation of iron 3 plus complexes with other water, which gives us a yellow color, or with the thiocyanate ion, which gives us a deep or blood red color. It is important to remember that only transition metals can form these complexes, so therefore, complexation tests are only applicable for transition metals. Precipitation is the formation of a solid or an ionic compound that is insoluble in water. This is also a qualitative test as we are observing for the formation of a solid. And sometimes precipitates can also have a unique color. For example, lead iodide, which we'll discuss in a moment, has a very special bright yellow color. Precipitation test can only work for metal ions that usually produce precipitates with anions. Here's a list of all the metal ions that you will need to know how to identify. We'll go through these individually. Barium ion can be identified through two main ways. Precipitation by adding sulfate ions to produce barium sulfates. This is usually a white precipitate. The best way, however, is using the flame test, as barium ions in the presence of a flame will produce a pale green color. Very similar to barium, calcium ions can also be identified by adding sulfate ions to produce a white precipitate. In this case, this will be a calcium sulfate. Calcium ions can also be identified using the flame test, which produces an orange, red, or brick red color. If you were to distinguish between barium and calcium ions, it is a lot more effective to use a flame test as the two metals produce different colors. Magnesium ions are quite difficult to identify as they produce numerous precipitates which are all non-specific to magnesium. The flame test is not useful as magnesium produces no color. Therefore, among the metals, magnesium is usually identified through a process of elimination. Lead ions can be best identified using precipitation test. By adding sodium hydroxide, we can produce a white precipitate that is lead hydroxide. By reacting lead with iodide ions, we produce lead iodide, which has a very unique bright yellow color. This is perhaps the best way to identify lead, as the color of the precipitate is rather rare and unique. We can also produce a white precipitate by reacting lead with chloride. It is very important to remember that lead ions should not be tested using a flame test, as vaporized lead ions is a very severe health hazard. Silver ions have very similar chemical reactivities with lead ions. They can also be identified using a series of precipitation tests. Namely, with chloride, they produce a white precipitate. Bromide, they produce again a precipitate that is creamy in color. And the reaction with iodide ions produce a yellow precipitate. And you can see the color of the precipitates down here. Since silver and lead ions react with all the halides to produce precipitates, it is very difficult to use halides as a way to distinguish between the two different ions here. Another precipitation test besides the halogens is the reaction between silver ions and hydroxide ions. This produces silver hydroxide, which is a rather unstable compound that quickly decomposes to form a brown silver oxide solution. The formation of this brown solution is one of the effective ways to distinguish between silver ions and lead ions. Besides precipitation, silver ions can also be identified using complexation because they are transition metals. The reaction between silver chloride, that is a white precipitate, with ammonia solution produces a diamine silver ion complex where two molecules of ammonia are bonded to the centrally positioned silver ion. This complex is soluble in water, so the solution will look very transparent. If we add ammonia solution to lead chloride precipitates, it will not dissolve in water as no complexation reaction occurs, and this is because lead ion is not a transition metal. Copper ion can be identified through a variety of ways. 
It can be identified using precipitation by adding hydroxide ions to produce a blue precipitate copper 2 hydroxide. It can also be identified using a flame test, which gives you a very colorful flame that is a mixture of green and blue. Since copper ions are also an example of transistor metal, they can also be identified using complexation. Copper ion in an aqueous solution forms a complex with water molecules, that is copper to hexahydrate. It has a characteristic light blue appearance, for example, copper sulfate. If we add ammonia solution to a solution of copper, this will produce a second complex that has a deeper blue appearance. So sometimes when the light blue color of the copper solution is difficult to observe, we can add a small amount of ammonia to produce a much darker shade of blue to confirm the presence of copper ions. Iron 3 plus ions are also a type of transition metal. When we add hydroxide ions, it produces a brown precipitate, as shown here. In solution, iron 3 plus ions form complexes with water molecules that gives you a yellow appearance. And upon reacting with thiocyanate ions, it produces iron thiocyanate that has a blood red appearance, shown here. Iron 2 plus ions can be also identified by adding hydroxide to produce a green precipitate. And in solution, iron 2 plus ions also give you a pale green appearance shown here. Iron 2 plus ions can also be distinguished between iron 3 plus ions by using oxidation test. This is by adding a strong oxidizing agent such as permanganate. This will oxidize the iron 2 plus ions to produce iron 3 plus as the iron 2 plus ions are losing electrons. Remember that oxidation is the loss of electron. Permanganate ions has a characteristic purple color. If it's added to iron 2 plus ion, it will be reduced and it forms a colorless manganese ion. As a result, the purple appearance of permanganate will decolorize when added to iron 2 plus ion, but remain purple if added to iron 3 plus ion.